336. Failure of Statism. Calcedon Report number 92, April 1973. The failure of statism, whether in ancient Rome or today, usually centres on two areas, religion and economics. The two, moreover, are very closely related. In fact, economics was once taught as a branch of Christian ethics, because sound economics is simply the application of the principle, thou shalt not steal. Monetary policies and welfare economics have historically been very common means of robbing the middle class and redistributing a nation's wealth and resources. There are two basic premises to a sound social order, both of which are strongly emphasised in the Bible. First, man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of God. Matthew chapter 4 verse 4. See also Deuteronomy chapter 8 verse 3. Food alone cannot satisfy man. Man requires a purpose and meaning to life, and the absence of meaning renders life impossible. Wordsworth, in October of 1803, did not suffer materially, but his hopes in the French Revolution having been destroyed, he could, with the rise of Napoleon, feel only despair. He wrote in Poems Dedicated to National Independence and Liberty, Part 1, Number 22, I find nothing great, nothing is left which I can venerate, so that a doubt almost within me springs, of providence, such emptiness at length, seems at the heart of all things. I tremble at the sorrow of the time. A year earlier, Wordsworth wrote, 1802, Ibid, Part 1, Number 15, of man's plight in his day as one of Perpetual emptiness, unceasing change, no single volume paramount, no code, no master spirit, no determined road. Wordsworth experienced some of the earlier anguish which ushered in the era of revolutions. We are now deeper in that crisis and despair. What's there to live for? asked a youth of twenty recently who had tried every kind of experience, felt burned out and was seriously considering suicide. Time and again, generations of men who have been materially rich have turned on their culture and destroyed it because it failed to provide them with a reason for living. Second, while man cannot live by bread alone, neither can he live without bread. Man can no more neglect the material necessities of life than he can the religious. Food is basic to life, and economics deals with the necessities and the amenities of life, their supply and demand, and their flow. Men require a sense of security with respect to their ultimate goals, with regard to the meaning of life, and with respect to the economic realm. A man can take a great deal of hardship and difficulty if he feels that what he earns is sure, that his work pays off, and that his property is not subject to confiscation by decree or by taxation. To feel insecure in one's possessions is unsettling and destructive. It erodes the value of man's work and purpose. As a result, while inflationary economics brings for a time more than a little wealth to the debtor classes, it also brings an unsettling fear of confiscation. Consider, for example, what Orton reported in 1950 concerning Britain. A steeply graduated income tax has long been the backbone of British fiscal policy. The standard rate is now, 1949 to 1950, 45%. On this was superimposed in 1948 to 1949 a special tax on investment income, which in effect was, and was acknowledged to be, a capital levy. On higher income brackets, the total tax ran well over 100% of gross income. A man with wife and two children, getting an investment income of $36,000, was liable for a tax of $37,500. A bachelor with $100,000 of such income had to find $130,000. This, of course, meant throwing all kinds of property, land, houses, cottages, farms, furniture, books, art collections onto a buyer's market. That was done. But it also meant, as it was intended to mean, the transfer of innumerable personal and private social responsibilities to the state. That was done too. Now the state has them. The Inland Revenue Commissioners, in the report for the year ended March 31st, 1949, 
officially state that there are only 70 people left in Britain with incomes after taxes of more than $24,000. Quietly, as this result has been accomplished, one would have to look back to the French or Russian revolutions for a comparable precedent. William Aylett Orton, The Economic Role of the State, Chicago, Illinois, University of Chicago Press, 1950, pages 101 and 102. After such a confiscation, wealth is still possible, but it is at the sufferance of the state and subject to its confiscation. The modern state is in crisis, both religiously and economically, and it has created both crises. Since the French Revolution, the modern state has worked against biblical religion steadily. This has been under the guise of a separation of church and state, a worthy goal, but in reality, what has been done is to disestablish Christianity and to establish humanism as a religion of the state. Every state or political order is a religious establishment. All law is enacted morality or procedural thereto, and morality is the relational aspect of religion. The January 22, 1973 US Supreme Court decision on abortion, Jane Roe et al. v. Henry Wade, 41 LW 4213, specifically cited as precedent and authority for abortion, quote, ancient religion, end quote. By this, it plainly meant, not the Old Testament faith, but the religion of Greece and Rome, paganism. The court rendered a religious decision in terms of modern and ancient humanism. The major offensive against biblical faith began with the status takeover of education and its conversion from a biblical to a humanistic orientation. Modern status education is intensely religious, but its religion is humanism, and its goal is the conversion of youth to the faith of the state and faith in the humanistic state. The power of the state has been greatly enhanced by the takeover of education. The child was reshaped in terms of status premises and status loyalties, and expected to be a ready martyr for the state and its warfare. Nothing has contributed more to the rise of the state and its power than its status school, and nothing is now more destructive of it. Whether in the Soviet Union or the Western world, the product of the state school is increasingly a lawless moral and political anarchist who is as hostile to his country as to God. The result is a growth of lawlessness which the state cannot check. Oscar Newman in Defensible Space, New York, New York, Macmillan, 1972, points out that we are witnessing the breakdown of the social mechanisms which once checked crime and supported police activity because few neighbours share beliefs and values. The sense of community is gone, and also the sense of security in one's own home. As Newman points out, the home and its environs must be felt to be secure or the very fabric of society comes under threat. In the economic sphere, the policy of theft has led to the progressive decline of economic morale. The attitude is that being economically successful is somehow a sin that must be atoned for by paying off the failures. As a result, the tax structure is designed to redistribute the wealth in terms of this principle. The US foreign aid program is also an application of this same idea, and money has been readily appropriated to the, quote, underdeveloped, end quote, countries as a compensation for their backwardness. In the past year, the same policy has been used by the United States in dealing with the European dollar crisis. John Connolly, Peter Peterson, Arthur Burns and President Nixon have all, in various ways, attacked the idea of surpluses as immoral. The establishment economist, Paul Samuelson, stated, even if the dollar should turn out to be somewhat overvalued, this primarily puts the onus on the surplus countries to appreciate their currencies unilaterally, particularly the mark and the yen, or else they should swallow our dollars of deficit without complaining. Morgan Guarantee Survey, New York, New York, July 1972. Success and enterprise, in other words, must be punished as somehow immoral. Here's the key. Over and over again, it is insinuated that somehow success, enterprise and profits are, per se, immoral. The US Supreme Court cites pagan religion for its authority 
and statist the world over cite a thief's morality to vindicate their principles. Economics cannot escape from moral fundamentals. Either thou shalt not steal is true, or the good society requires that we steal from those who have in order to equalize society and reward those who have not. The new religion and morality, with its economics of statism, is the same old sin condemned by Scripture from Moses through St. John. Bewailing the situation will not alter the matter. The answer lies elsewhere. There is no dramatic road to recovery. Only as men change will society change. A responsibility today, whether in the various branches of the state, in the church, in society at large, in schools, unions, corporations and families, stems from the false faiths and values of the individuals involved. We live in a day when a pornographic film has become the, quote, in thing to see, and porno chic is common in prominent circles. In late 1972, in a few weeks, a book, The Autobiography of a Prostitute and Madam, sold at a record level and was expected to reach 5 million copies by spring 1973 for the United States and Canada alone. Very popular also have been two books by a notorious pimp, and pimps have become, quote, heroes, end quote, to many. Men live, not by faith today, but by debt and envy, and they look with suspicious eyes on anyone better than themselves. We are told by Plutarch how in ancient Greece the men of Athens banished the honest Aristides. When Aristides the just, unknown to the man, asked one voter if Aristides had ever done him any injury, the man replied, None at all, neither know I the man, but I am tired of hearing him everywhere called the just. The mentality today is not too different. Is a man successful? Then he must be a scoundrel, and if not, why should he have more than others? The result is an economic problem, but the cure is not economic. It is moral and religious, and it begins with you. If it does not begin there, then judgment will. The easiest answer in too many eras has been to point the finger at persons and classes and demand, off with their heads. Such people want the world to be good, but they want to be spared the necessity of being good themselves, a schizophrenic position. They want evil to be punished in others, but not in themselves. They see the mote in another man's eye, but not the beam in their own. Matthew chapter 7 verse 5 But, above all else, such people look for a statist answer rather than the personal, moral and religious one. If only we can control the state and manipulate people, all will be well, they reason. True order is seen as a man-made order, as some form of humanism. In one of his early writings, Karl Marx summed up the essence of radicalism in religious terms. To be radical is to grasp things by the root. But, for man, the root is man himself. The doctrine that man is a supreme being for man. T.W. Bottomore, editor, Karl Marx, Early Writings, New York, New York, McGraw Hill, 1964, page 52. Marx's definition of the radical fits most modern men and almost every state in the world today. Man is the supreme being for modern man. It should not surprise us that the world moves more and more into the jungle of Marx's mind. It begins with the same premise. If man is the supreme being for man, then man makes his own laws as he goes along. As a result, if man says that theft is virtue, then supposedly theft becomes virtue. Our modern economics and our modern established religion, humanism, are alike consequences of making man his own god. But our Lord declared, For it is written, Thou shalt worship the Lord thy God, and him only shalt thou serve. Matthew chapter 4 verse 10 And God has built in a problem which confronts the humanistic state and will progressively in the days ahead. Man shall not and cannot long live by bread alone, and neither can he live without it. The more the state increases its power, the more it undermines both the religious and economic life of man, and its own life as well.